But I make three editions of each neon sign uh, so that I can share them with more people in the world and actually put them more places in the world. Later that same year, I made a second edition that ended up being acquired by the Smithsonian's Renwick Gallery. And around that same time, I started having conversations with Xander, as he said, about where in the world we could bring this sign that would be a meaningful place to the organization. It was around that time that I learned about this property on Mount Washington in Nevada and the fact that it's the home to some of the world's longest living trees, the bristlecone pines, some of which have lived over 5,000 years. That process of actually imagining what we were about to do and then making it a reality took about a year. And it involved making a third edition of the neon sign with my studio assistant, Jess Green, in my studio in Dallas, Texas. And I made this sign specifically for this opportunity, the, the scale of it and also the way that it's constructed in modular components so that it can easily assemble and disassemble. So here you can see it in the back of a moving truck, and the sign structure is made of steel, right? And all of the glass components are stored in that wood crate. And I just want to take a second to acknowledge the fact that we use glass for this specific project because it's kind of insane. <laughs> um, and the most insane part about it is that I didn't make any backups. <laughs> so we only had one piece of glass for each part of the sign, and if any of them broke along the way, we would have been screwed. But we probably would have found ways of making it still happen. But that materiality of glass was actually a really important part of this project for me because I think it really speaks to that fragility of like possibility reality relationships, right? And it's interesting to think about when the culmination of an idea draws nearer and we could, we've been planning for a year and we can now really imagine what it's going to look like on this mountaintop. But the closer we got to actually making that a reality, the more fragile that sense of possibility actually became because one broken letter could have like totally made it potentially impossible. And one of the most significant challenges, as you can see here, was getting the glass up this mountain safely, up to 11,000 feet. It's so interesting to learn about the bristlecone pines and the fact that they actually thrive in these really extreme conditions that you can only find at these you know, really high elevations. So it was really interesting to try to make that journey up to this place where they live. And of course, we had to do all these crazy switchbacks and the road was dirt and there was all these huge ruts and every time we went over a bump I was freaking out inside. <laughs> But thankfully, I was in really good hands. And I also had like a whole team of people who were so equipped and like fully, you know, acquainted with installing art projects in really extreme environments. So we arrived at the mountaintop around noon. And after lunch, we immediately got to work assembling the sign structure. And our goal was to have everything set up by sunset. Um, and this video for me really shows how fast that afternoon seemed to go by. And I think it's kind of funny because it might be the shortest term project the Long Now Foundation has ever done. <laughs> <laughs> As you can see, we did manage to get the sign up and working right before the sunset, and I'm so thankful we did. Another artist and also a Long Now Research Fellow, Jonathan Keats, something that he said about this particular moment was how it allowed us to witness the simultaneity of so many different timescales, right? The flashing on and off of those words every three seconds, coupled with the passing of the clouds overhead, gathering and parting, and then the change of the light as the sun set over the course of about an hour. All of those things were then juxtaposed with the lifespans, the 5,000-year-old trees that were surrounding us, right? So it was quite a magical experience. But one thing, actually, that did not go according to plan um, was that the electronic flasher that I typically use to change the states of those signs the, every three seconds 
actually didn't work, and we couldn't figure out why. We thought it had something to do with the electricity coming out of the generator, not jiving with it. We couldn't figure it out. So ultimately, I had to plug and unplug these different sections of the neon sign at this power strip. And you can see in this video how determined I was <laughs> to keep that rhythm really consistent. For me, it's so, so, so important that each state of the sign lasts three seconds, not four, not two, three seconds, right? And that it repeats over and over and over again, creating that really sort of meditative experience. So when you look at this video, uh, imagine me off to the right-hand side of the scene, counting one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi. That sort of meditative and very mechanical rhythm of the sign became kind of like a ticking clock, you know? And that was juxtaposed with our own lived experiences of time and the length of our own human lifespans. So people really love to photograph the sign when it's illuminated, of course, right? Um, but that third state where all the words turn off for three seconds is actually really important for me because from my point of view, it actually returns our attention to the landscape. And this was especially crucial here in this really epic landscape, right? The Basin and Range province, I actually learned, is home to some of the highest mountain peaks in the contiguous United States. And that elevated perspective is also an important conceptual component of this project. Because I like to think that shift in perspective, that bird's eye view that we get from a mountaintop, as being really similar to that broader perspective of time, right? Seeing that longer now. Yet another time scale we can experience when we look out at that landscape is the geological time scale and the time it takes for geological forces to stretch the Earth's crust and to form a mountain. As the sun set, the stars began to appear. And I don't know why, but for some reason this was very unexpected. You know, when you think about putting an Ian sign on the mountain, you think about like the sunset, but I never could have imagined that the Milky Way, the band of the Milky Way, would literally be right behind it. It was beautiful. And this revealed a whole other time scale, that of galaxies. And I didn't actually know until the other day that our galaxy is spinning. Did you know that? <laughs> and that it takes about 240 million years to complete one rotation. So here in this one image, we have two vastly different timescales, right? A present moment that lasts, depending on how you think of it, three seconds or nine seconds, and one that lasts 240 million years. So what I've always loved about this quote is the way that we can each relate to it like on a very individual level. And when we think about this present moment and how it was once unimaginable, we can think about our current relationships or the kind of current state of our career. But I also love how it can uh, also kind of speak to a more universal level and things that are going on in the world that you know, affect all of us. I like to think about how if this present moment was once unimaginable, how it naturally makes you wonder and want to try to imagine you know, what the future will hold. So I personally am trying to imagine a future of gender equality, of equal pay, right? And equal access to abortions. Wouldn't that be something? <laughs> but, <laughs> but I wonder what you are all imagining for the future. I think in moments like this, which we had sort of gazing out at the world from a mountaintop, or you could have gazing up at the stars at night, or that feeling you get when you're standing in front of a work of art that like really, really moves you. That broader perspective that you get, that bird's eye view, or that feeling of awe, maybe, can give you a new way of understanding the world, right? It can give you that shift in perspective and it can help you see the bigger here and the longer now. And the roles that we play in it, both individually and also collectively. And I think that that shift in perspective can actually help us imagine otherwise unimaginable futures. And this 
was definitely an unimaginable future for me at some point. Being able to stand beside Stuart Brand and gaze up at this sign that I made illuminating his words. I'm really grateful for this experience. I'm also really grateful to all of these people who participated in this project, some of whom are not even pictured here. But thank you all for helping make this moment a reality.